Harvard professor of psychology, Daniel Gilbert, makes the observation, as do others, that if you were to win the lottery and say, come into an unexpected additional $10 million, uh, you would experience an initial burst of happiness. But a year from now, chances are, you would be just as happy or unhappy as you were before you won the lottery. And the reason for this is because of a phenomenon that psychologists describe as the hedonic treadmill, where in life we may experience something good, uh, something pleasant, and we feel this rush of pleasurable emotions, but then those feelings fade away because we get used to the new reality and we don't find ourselves moving ahead in terms of our, our place on the happiness continuum. Uh, Cynthia Heimel is a journalist who works out of New York City. And she is not writing from a religious perspective, but uh, she did write this. When God wants to play a really rotten, practical joke on you, he grants you your deepest wish. And so Cynthia Heimel knows many people, ordinary people in New York City, who aspire to become celebrity actors, artists, or entertainers. And she writes that some of these people have been granted their deepest wish. And she writes, I pity them. I pity them. Because the morning after they became famous, they wanted to take their lives through an overdose. They had finally gotten the thing that they wanted most, the fame thing. The thing that they thought would make their lives bearable and happy and fulfilling, but, but nothing had changed. And so they were so disillusioned that they became miserable, howling, and insufferable. If we're looking to money or fame or power or prestige to bring us a lasting sense of satisfaction, uh, we will find ourselves unfulfilled. In fact, if we're looking to these things, money, fame, prestige, or, or power to fill a void inside us, it will be like we're trying to quench the thirst of our soul with seawater. We'll simply find ourselves thirstier and thirstier. And as Craig mentioned, we're in a new sermon series called Ancient Wisdom for Modern Living. And today we're going to be looking at how we search for contentment. And we're going to be looking at the ancient wisdom that, that David portrays in Psalm 131, where in this prayer, in this poem, we see that he has actually discovered the secret of contentment. So listen to the words of King David, which are now part of Scripture from Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. Now, let's pray together. Living God, as was true for David, through the work of your Spirit in and among us, enable our hearts to find rest and true contentment in you. Help us to find that path and help us to discover you more fully. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So in this message, we're going to explore the path to contentment that David discovered. David begins by praying, My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. 
I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, I am content. Now, in verse 2, uh, David talks about calming himself. And in another translation, he's rendered as saying, I have quieted my ambitions. David, in this passage, models genuine humility before God. And as you may know, as I just mentioned, David was a king. So he is at the very top of the food chain in his world. And yet he is able to maintain this posture of humility before God. My heart is not proud, he says. My eyes are not haughty. How was he able to do that? He was able to do that in part because he remembered where he had come from. David was not always at the top of the food chain in his world. He had been a lowly shepherd, which would have put him at the very bottom of the social strata of his world. He was also the youngest among eight brothers. And so in his traditional culture, he would have been the least likely among his brothers to be chosen for some kind of leadership role. In fact, when the prophet Samuel is told by God to go to the house of Jesse and anoint one of his sons as the future king of Israel, Samuel is there at the house and the father Jesse begins to parade the seven older brothers of David before Samuel as potential candidates for the kingship of Israel. He doesn't even bother to bring David before the prophet Samuel for consideration because David, after all, is working as a lowly shepherd. He is the youngest among his brothers, as I mentioned. Uh, he is the runt of the pack. He is working a kind of side job as the equivalent of a skip the dishes bicycle delivery boy. And yet it is David whom God chooses to serve as the future king, and eventually he becomes king. And David recognizes that he is who he is. He has attained what he has attained because of the grace and the mercy and the kindness of God. And so his heart remains humble. David says, I have calmed myself and quieted my ambitions. I am like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Now, David here uh, speaks of being like a child that has been weaned from breastfeeding, which in his world would have occurred at around three years of age for, for most toddlers. And he says, I am more content like a, a weaned child who is now more satisfied because of eating solid foods. As I was preparing for this message, uh, someone found out uh, from our community that I would be speaking from Psalm 131, uh, a mother of four children. And she shared with me that she noticed that before her children were weaned, they basically saw her as a food source. And so when her young children who were unweaned uh, were hungry, they would paw at her shirt, desperate to be nourished by, by her milk, by, by, by the food that she would provide. But this mother also observed that after her children were weaned, uh, they realized they had another food source. And they could simply cuddle with their mother contentedly. And she felt valued not just as someone who had provided food, but valued as someone to be in relationship for its own sake. And David here is saying, like a child that has been weaned and is now more satisfied with solid food, I am content. And as I mentioned earlier, he's able to say as a result of that, that he is able to calm himself and quiet his ambitions. This summer, I read a biography of Winston Churchill by William Manchester called The Last Lion. And through that biography, I learned that when Winston was a young boy, he was sent off to a British boarding school. 
And I also learned that he absolutely admired his father, Randolph, who was a member of parliament. And when he found out that his dad would be visiting his small town where the boarding school was located, Winston would in inevitably write to his father saying, I hear you're going to be in town for work. Uh, would you please take some time to come and visit me? And his father would never have time for his son. He just felt he was too busy. He just couldn't be bothered to spend 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour uh, visiting his son at school. So he just never showed up there. And then um, the biography describes how uh, at Winston's boarding school, there would be certain weekends or certain days when parents were actively encouraged to visit their children. And young Winston would, would write to his mother something like, Dear mummy dearest, uh, we have some of these letters, um, please promise me that you won't disappoint your dear Winnie yet again. All the other parents will be visiting their children. Please don't break my heart yet again. Uh, and yet Winston's mother would reply, oh, but I have this very important party, this dinner party to host, so I, I won't be able to come and see you. And we also know, uh, as it came out later, that she was having all kinds of affairs with all kinds of men, including the king. So she really was quite busy. Uh, and she had no time for her son. Winston, as a, as a fairly young child, mused. He wondered out, out loud. He, he wrote down these words. I, I, I wonder if great men, people who become great men, were often neglected as children. And we know that Winston Churchill made a great contribution, but that he was also a workaholic who could not quiet his ambitions. And maybe the reason he felt he had to work so hard was that he felt like he needed to prove to his father, who had essentially abandoned him, that he was worthy of his attention. Maybe he felt at some level that he needed to show his mother that her affection for him was, in fact, justified. Winston Churchill was not able to quiet his ambitions, but David was. David was a king. He was ambitious, but he was able to calm his self-centered, grandiose ambitions. And if we follow David's path, we can be ambitious in the best sense, but we can quiet our self-centered, grandiose ambitions if we realize we don't need to prove that we are worthy, if we realize we don't need to prove that we are good enough, if we realize, like David did, that we are loved and already accepted and cherished by our maker. And if that's the case, we can be ambitious, but that ambition can flow from a place of gratitude and contentment rather than out of a driven, desperate need to prove that we are enough. Now, we might ask the question, well, does ambition and achievement play any role in our actual happiness? Let me um, answer that question by relating to a conversation I had with someone some time ago. Um, this past summer, uh, like many of you, I uh, watched some of the Olympic Games on, on, on TV. And one day I was watching part of the decathlon and watching the decathletes compete there in Paris. And uh, I thought about a conversation I had with a decathlete um, some, some years ago. Ashton Eaton won the gold medal at the Olympic Games in London back in uh, 2012. And then Ashton repeated as the gold medalist at the Rio Olympic Games in 2016. And I, I think we've got a slide of him. Uh, I had met Ashton in a, in a group setting, so it was fairly natural for me to reach out to him sometime after he had won the gold medals and just ask him about his experience. And so uh, during the conversation, I said, Ashton, you know, we all have insecurities, but after you won your gold medals, did you sort of feel like, oh, now I've accomplished this, I'm, I'm enough? And Ashton said, no, 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 it, it wasn't like that at all. He said, winning the gold medal, 
especially the first one, felt really great. But after a while, I looked down and I thought, hmm, it's just a medallion after all, just a piece of metal. And he told me that the best thing about participating in the Olympics was that it pushed him to do his very best. And then Ashton said, you know, winning the gold medal was a little bit like having a Sunday and then getting a cherry put on top of it. It was like the little extra uh, on your Sunday. It was like the cherry on top. Now, if we have a kind of symbolic gold medal in our imagination that represents something we really want to achieve, maybe it's to accumulate a certain amount of money, or uh, if you're living in, in Metro Vancouver, uh, one day purchasing a condo or a house, which seems so unattainable for, for, for many people. Or maybe the gold medal for you is attaining a certain level of education or a particular kind of job or role in society or relationship. And as exciting as it may be when you get the call that, yes, you got it, um, if you are looking to that thing to nourish your soul and give you a lasting sense of satisfaction, it will be like you are trying to stay nourished on a cherry on top of a Sunday alone or by the icing of a cake alone. Those things may be sweet, but they will not fortify you over the long run. They will not sustain you. Professor Arthur Brooks teaches at Harvard, and, and he makes the observation that, that, that uh, in order to stay physically healthy, we need a diet that includes the macronutrients of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And in a spiritual sense, at a soul level, if we are trying to feel fortified and nourished through achievement and accomplishment alone or primarily, it will be like we're trying to live physically on the cherry on top of a sundae or by the icing on top of a cake alone. We'll find ourselves empty, famished, and spiritually and emotionally mal nourished. So how do we live so that we feel that we are nourished by the presence of God as David did? How do we move toward becoming like a child that has been weaned from its mother and is now content? Uh, or to quote uh, Dallas Willard, or to paraphrase Dallas Willard, how can we arrange our life so that we are experiencing deep contentment, joy, and confidence in our everyday life with God. How do we do that? Well, let me um, shift to another image here to help try and answer that question. I've got a friend named uh, Jim Murphy, who was a professional baseball player and is now a performance coach. In his forthcoming book, The Best Possible Life, uh, Jim writes about what he describes as the Michael Phelps principle. Uh, if he were writing a little bit later, uh, or had been, uh, he might have written about the Summer Macintosh principle, uh, our, our champion Canadian swimmer from here in Canada. But he writes about the Michael Phelps principle. Uh, Jim points out that Michael Phelps, over his swimming career, won 23 Olympic gold medals. And, and, and Jim observes that that's actually more gold medals than most nations have won in their entire history. Uh, Jim is a believer in God. In fact, he was part of the 10th community when he was living in Vancouver, so you may be acquainted with him. Uh, Jim asked the question, when you think about Michael Phelps's athletic achievements, how much credit should Michael get and how much credit should God get? Probably a question you, you haven't thought about before. Um, and he's, he responds by saying, well, you might say, well, if I believe in God, if you believe in God, 50-50, 50% Michael, 
50% God in terms of the credit. And then Jim says, well, uh, if you know about the fact that for five years, Michael Phelps did not miss a singular day of workouts, you might think, well, actually, I'll give Michael 75% credit, God 25% credit, or Michael 95% credit, and God 5% credit. And then Jim says, but think about it this way. Uh, Michael needed a certain kind of body to achieve what he did, a certain kind of DNA that would enable him to engage in long, powerful strokes in the water. Where did he get his body? Where did he get his DNA? From his parents. He inherited that. And, and then Jim asked the question, how many gold medals would Michael have won if he had been born 400 years ago in the place of the world now known as Afghanistan? Well, we know the answer to that question. He would have won precisely zero gold medals because the Olympics were not being hosted 400 years ago. And if he had been born into that part of the world 400 years ago, we know that he would have spent most of his time foraging for food, not looking for places to train and swim. So Jim points out, so think about it. Uh, Michael inherited his body. He was born into a time and place where the Olympics were actually being hosted. He had the opportunity to train. And if you think about it that way, you might say... 98% God, 2% Michael. So he talks about that 98 colon 2 principle. Now, think about your own life for a moment. Maybe it's hard to relate to Michael Phelps. It is, for I think, for most of us. Uh, but you've achieved a certain level of success. You have been able to overcome certain difficulties. You're at a certain place on your journey. And, and you will be heading to a certain place in the future. How much credit can you take for what you've accomplished thus far in your position? Uh, you get some credit because you, you were part of it for sure. But how much of who you are and where you are is really the result of the grace and the kindness of God? And when you realize the answer to that question, whatever it may be, you will become more grateful to God and you'll feel more nourished in your life with him. And you don't have to be an Olympic gold medalist to be thankful for what you've been given in life. I think of Jane Kenyon, a poet who died of leukemia when she was just age 47. And when Jane was in a great deal of physical pain because of her cancer, and when she could see death on the horizon of her existence, uh, she wrote this, this poem, a beautiful poem called Otherwise. Jane writes, I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birchwood. All morning I did work I love. At noon I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this day. But one day, I know it will be otherwise. And even in her suffering, even as death loomed on the horizon for her, Jane was grateful for the strength to be able to walk up a hill with her dog. She was thankful to be surrounded by beautiful art and to be able to enjoy the company of someone she loved. That poem uh, reminded me of, of 
a person in our community right here named Rich Mills, as some of you may know. Um, Rich sustained a very serious mountain biking accident this summer, breaking several bones. And at the time, it was not clear that he would ever be able to walk again. It wasn't clear that he would be able to move his arms as he once had been able to move them. But he's, he's walking, and he has more mobility in his arms than he would have envisioned, and he's experiencing healing and wholeness, and he is deeply grateful. And we who know and love him are deeply thankful to God. And we can experience a sense of gratitude and nourishment from God, even in our adversity. And we can help participate in that process as David did by making it a habit to praise God, to thank God. Whether it's in worship, in community as we're doing now, or whether we take time like our friend Ann Voskamp does, or my friend Lorna Duick does in the evening to write down three or five things across the day that you're thankful for, or like someone else I know does the following morning, recalls the last 24 hours, the previous day, and writes down things that he is thankful for but we can cultivate that. And when we cultivate this heart of gratitude and recognize that we have been blessed and gifted by God in all kinds of ways, not only will we be, will we be more grateful and uh, content and feel more nourished, but we'll also have more love to offer those around us. Uh, I know uh, someone uh, who served as a pastor who asked the question, wouldn't you like to be uh, like the silver medalist uh, in, in the skating event where the gold medalist was able to nail the quad, you know, the four and a half um, rotation um, yeah, very difficult uh, spin move uh, in figure skating and, and just be thrilled with the beauty of their jump and their achievement. Wouldn't you want to be the kind of person where you would just admire that like you admire a sunset where it wouldn't matter whether it was your success or their success. You just rejoiced in the beauty of that achievement, of that, of that move. I think we'd all like to be like that. I've shared with some of you about uh, Dr. J. Christie Wilson. Uh, when I was uh, making the transition from the business world uh, toward uh, vocational pastoral ministry, I was considering some different potential seminaries, theological graduate schools. And I was checking out a school just north of Boston. And part of the reason I was interested in that school was because of one of its professors, Dr. J. Christie Wilson, who had served as a beloved and much respected missionary in Afghanistan for, for 20 years between the 1950s and the 1970s, and was now teaching at this school north of Boston. So I arranged to visit the school. I contacted one of the administrators. And I said, I'm going to visit the school. I'm, I'm thinking about the possibility of, of applying to study there. And uh, I wonder if you could arrange for me to meet with Professor Christy Wilson. Um, and, and I said, the reason I want to meet with him is because if I get accepted and enroll, uh, I'd love for him to serve as my academic advisor. And so the administrator said, well, if he's, if he's uh, around, you can probably see him. But, but he will not serve as your academic advisor. That's simply not possible because at this stage in his career, he's not taking on any new advisees. So I go to the school, go to Boston. Uh, I'm able to meet with uh, Dr. Wilson. We're in his office and I say, um, Dr. Wilson, uh, I, I hear you're not taking on any new academic advisees. So I totally respect that. But I wonder if you'd consider making an exception. <laughs> he doesn't know who I am. Um, we just met, and he looks at me and says, I'd be honored to advise you. We take a walk across campus, go into the, the seminary bookstore. He buys me a copy of a book that he's written. I eventually enroll in the school. And as a student, I remember having a conversation with Dr. Wilson again in his office, and he was talking about his undergraduate days at Princeton University, where he was uh, running track and field. 
Dr. Wilson said, I was um, in an intercollegiate uh, track and field competition, and I, I was uh, about to run in the 400, which, which, as you likely know, is one lap around the, the track. Gun goes off. We start running. And part way through the race, there is some inadvertent contact with the runners. And one of the runners trips uh, as a result and falls into the grass on the infield. Uh, we turn the last corner and I'm able to accelerate and I cross the finish line first. A little while later, I'm awarded with a gold medal. And then uh, Christy, Dr. Wilson explained that he then um, went over to the runner that had fallen and injured himself, and he was still uh, nursing his knee, um, s- sitting down. And Dr. Wilson uh, crouched down and he said, you know, I had the, the good fortune of crossing the finish line first. And he said, but you were faster than me today. And if you hadn't have fallen, you would have won the gold medal. And so you really deserve this. And he took off the gold medal and put it around his neck. You know, for Dr. Christy Wilson, he wasn't seeking to have his soul nourished through a gold medal. He wasn't seeking to find his satisfaction in some kind of athletic achievement or going to a a fancy university, getting some fancy degree. He was seeking his deep satisfaction in God. And as a result, he became, he grew into this content person who was able to love others really well. And we can live like that too. What was Christie's secret? He followed a king greater than David. A king who would also pray David's prayer because it was part of scripture. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I have calmed myself and quieted my ambitions. I am like a wean child with its mother. Like a wean child, I am content. And Jesus, the greater king, according to Philippians 2, did not consider his status as being equal with God, something to be used for his own personal advantage, but rather made himself nothing, took on the form of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And if we will walk in the pathway that Jesus has created for us toward God, with God, where our sins are washed away, and we are filled with his presence, and we recognize all that he's done for us, we will be grateful. We will be more content. And like Christy Wilson, we will have more love to author those right around us. Let's pray together. If you want, you can just mirror this prayer, this very simple prayer in your heart. Regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the challenges you may be facing or or the good times you may be experiencing, you can pray, God, help me find my contentment in you alone. Help me to find my contentment in you. And may I grow in gratitude as I become more aware of your grace. And as that happens, may I be satisfied and become a source of love to those around me. May I become a source of your love for those around me. Thank you for being my good shepherd, Jesus. Help me to be able to say, with you in my life, I lack nothing that I truly, truly need. May it be so for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.